it, we all lost our minds with how hilarious the intrigue of the names got that we, it was the best thing ever. finally brought you here. Behold, Forge the Narrative. Hey everybody, welcome to Forge the Narrative. My name is Paul, your host, Bail about Lost Salt Podcast. I'm joined out by Red Powell. Hello. Tanya Gates and Adam Camilleri. Hi everybody. Evening. Welcome to the show, everyone. If you are new here, please like, share, subscribe, leave a comment, do whatever you do. We are a weekly show and would really appreciate that hassle-free support. I want to talk about big units versus small units and i don't want to get censored (laughs) (laughs) so in in the most in the most recent codexes we've seen the option to expand some of these units to 20 person units we've been talking about the value of that especially with admec and i actually over the last few days i've i've built 40 rangers with the galvanic rifles i mixed in a few special weapons here and there and and as a because in my list currently i have uh 20 vanguard that i currently move up in the the dune striders the transports and i've got 40 rangers that hang back and lay down all this this range fire and you know constantly kind of configure messing around with configurations you know i think the conventional wisdom at least but certainly we've been talking about the larger units better targets for stratagems because you get more value out of whatever your cp investment is auras obviously do better with more troop you know more figures to to influence but what about a bunch of five man units? Maybe even in transports too, where to get out and just kind of push up and control lots of the board or minimize your risk when your opponents are doing similar things maybe with with their units. It is is it really a choice? Or is it a choice? So uh, I I do think it's really interesting how I mean I'm pointing out it's just it's becoming a bit of a theme now. It's almost unavoidable that I think G dub are trying to kind of expand the ways and means of which we play armies in ninth edition but i don't think they want as far as i can tell i don't think they want any army one army to be skewed into uh here's this is an msu army this is a horde army this is a you know marine army because marines kind of straddle both sides of the middle the middle brand which is why they are both so fun to play and kind of frustrating for others looking in but yeah so far every single um ninth edition codex apart from marines who can do it by having essentially 10 man in, um, intercessor units having 20 wounds they all have a kind of mainstay 20 man or 20 wound block unit you know with from pox walkers to uh rich witches racks and cabalites now sisters and we've got rangers and vanguard this is a theme it's undeniably this is a thing yeah i'm just putting it out to you guys i'm sorry to, to bounce paul's question back paul do you have any ideas why you reckon they're doing this or is this just to diversify what people can play well i, I don't know i mean other than if you are let's say you're fulfilling your minimum troop slots for one of these detachments you could f- bulk up that to make it to make more of the core of the army possible and visible on the table as you're maybe walking past it aesthetically yeah i feel like in eighth edition a lot of codexes had maybe like one or two builds and that was all that you'd really see in the meta um so maybe it's a push to sort of get people to think a little bit more out of the box to feel like they have more tools, more flexibility within the codex so that we see more variation on the table. Tanya, I totally agree on, on 8th edition. I, I, I look back to 7th edition as well with the Gladius, right? Um, the ability to bring a bunch of small... Now, of course, the Gladius was completely like i mean it's almost so far removed at this point when you can bring so let's not bring what, it up. still a little a little too soon oh, <laughs> but it's so good because you could just bring all those rhinos you know what i mean and so like how are sisters that you know that far removed and what they were trying to accomplish because back then the game was different in regards of and you know going into eighth edition as we really adopted the itc model uh, you know rule set of the time it was you could hold one hold more kill one kill more and that ability to bring that to bear was something else uh, it, it really was significant and so when you look at sisters or or uh admech or even dark eldar or whatever um guard it, space marines it, i think a lot of armies can still do it now uh where you're bringing the msus and 
you just flood the field with it. You know, we talked about bus stop list um, maybe around a year ago, right? And mm-hmm. where they just sit there. And there's parts of Necron armies now that can just sit there. There's all sorts of armies that if you flood the field with so much, there's some of those units are legitimately just going to do that. They're just going to sit there and score because you have such a, a flood of MS. You, you can only target so much. In fact, there, there's probably something psychologically to the war game where you versus having a, a, a you know a 40 man block having four 10 man blocks and those 10 model blocks are it's harder for someone you know they want to put the weight of their dice against a unit and then another unit and how frustrating is it as you split fire and you don't kill everything in that unit and then it holds in there to whatever extent and so there is I think there's something to that I think that absolutely it's it, it might not be the best statistically and in some cases as far as dice and weight and volume because we all know like more dice is always better on uh, most more cases. dice buffed up dice that's actually my where i where i start is like can i put this buff on a giant unit and get just a ton of value out of it that way exactly and i think that's the huge counter to this is that yeah and, and necrons i think are a great showcase for this and that like you can only put so many buffs in one area at a time. Uh, you know, honestly, Space Marines and, and Chaos Space Marines, I think of Berserkers, there's only, you could spread the buffs out, but if I want to weight the buffs, having a larger unit, you know, you can have, you can, I've, I've done it, you can have up to 20 Berserkers versus running eight Berserkers, which is what I usually do. I could have 16 Berserkers. I could buff that unit up to such an extent, putting three or four stratagems on it, costing me probably five or six CP. And I could just mow through a lot of things doing that. Um, or, I, you know, if I need to do a more economy of force kind of deal with my CP and stratagems, spread it out across the three to four squads of berserkers that I would typically bring. So, I, I mean, that those are my my general thoughts when I come to the, the mass, the, the hordes versus the MSU. I think you can hoard MSU. Um, and we've seen with Death Guard and whatnot, you can, you know, make smaller i say smaller as in fewer units but still have the weight and volume you need in those uh those smaller units still so for uh, gotta add mech on the brain obviously because i've been building them but for 50 points you could get uh, five rangers with a plasma gun yeah who's gonna who's gonna bother with that sometimes when you've got everything else on the field that's trying to score it now sometimes there'll be a target of opportunity but at the same time, you know, we need things to hold backfield objectives too. So, and so things like completing actions, uh, there's th- there's um, a secondary specific to the admech, the battlefield supremacy before deployment. Assign one objective marker to each battle round, and note this down in your army roster. An objective marker cannot be assigned to more than one battle round. Score three victory points at the end of the battle round if you control the objective marker assigned to that battle round. So just flood the field with an endless, mm. you know. <laughs> Uh, what is it? Uh, almost like lemmings just running out to the objectives and who cares if the five man unit gets picked up? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, I, I found this a lot with, uh, Harlequins at the start. I think this is one of the biggest reasons Harlequins had such prominent success at the start of a, a ninth edition. They were the real boiled down essence of MSU five, five, um, five troop in a character in a star weaver, five troop in a character in a star weaver times six times seven, you know, sometimes times eight. And then, um, without having any detrimental reasons not to, soup up and take allies i saw and this is in the previous dark eldar codex i played against people who had um you know three single courts of the archon that three single urgles you know sometimes a couple of lemayans and then a couple a handful of um dark eldar characters as well and then all of a sudden you're just like your um your water down your um sorry target of opportunity your um the way you differentiate and like disperse your damage just gets so stretched Mostly because of the the four plus nature of all the Harlequin units, the, you have fifty. Any shot you get through that hits and wounds, my, when you have minus, you know, um, range and then minus to wounds, possibly sometimes as well, gets halved by an invuln. You're just over under committing all the time. And I found them to be like the pure essence of the MSU. But now we're seeing the the opposite way. I had a crazy thought when I saw Necron Warriors come out. They're like, wow, that's what I want a horde to be. And um, since then. I got to say, hordes have only gotten stronger. I think I, I look at what twenty Necron warriors can do now, and I'll, I'll say straight up, like their damage output, their sheer like you get those Gorse Reapers into range and you chuck a couple of strats on there, a couple of buffs, they shred 
they shred like a troop unit probably shouldn't be able to shred, but they do it. <laughs> but now, like, they, I don't know if they're any, I, I've been looking at what Rangers can do and Vanguard could do, and I'm like, oh, that's not quite the same thing anymore, is it? This is another level. I mean, of course, the, the, dur- the durability isn't like for like. You know, Necrons can regen a lot easier and a lot more shenanigans in that way. And the five, the, the standing 5 plus invon from the Techno is indisputable value. Well, but pound for pound, what do you sh- think shreds more? You think the Necron Warriors shred more or the, or the Rangers slash Vanguard shred more? Uh, the Vang- the Rangers and Vanguard, I think they shred okay. more. Absolutely. Yeah, hands down. Not all, <laughs> like very little questions in my mind. They shred... They shred like Iron Hands used to shred, man. They they smash. Um, yeah, really good, really strong. Oh, and it's from long long range too. That's most most armies dedicate. It's um. I think we'll see you did or we can, like so we can theorize like the Tau. The they were they're very strong at like that thirty inch thirty six inch range, and mm-hmm. the Admech mimic that a bit. Where most armies get that type of output at the twenty four inch range, the eighteen inch range. And that's why I think there's. That's why I think we're looking at apples and oranges here with the Necrons and the, the um the Rangers and the Vanguard. Except we're in an oranges dominant market where the oranges is obviously better than an apple for some reason. <laughs> oh, I, I was vitamins. just curious. <laughs> is it what you thought and, uh, because of the way you phrased it? I was like, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's see, you're, you hit on hit the nail on the head. The Rangers do more damage than the Necron the than the Necron Warriors from 30 inches away. And Necrons only get comparable when they get to the 12 inch mark when they have flayers instead of. Uh, sorry, Reapers instead of Flayers, and they, they're they fully buffed within so much closer range, which is why I think the Rangers just hand down get it. And it, and I do think that translates to the Vanguard as well. The Vanguard um, have different applications for their offensive outputs, but they are phenomenally potent. Yeah, while we're comparing the, the Necrons to the Rangers, the Rangers for one turn, they're, they're going to be pretty stout. Uh, mm. I, I don't know if it compares to reanimation, but... Uh, whereas the Necrons are, are kind of stout in every turn, so it's it's kind of neat to see these the way it kind of balances out. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, the same goes for the sisters in a lot of ways. The sisters have a lot of um, incredibly powerful one turn mechanics built in the blessing systems they've got. I can't remember what they've called the when you upgrade, you get the you get one buff all the time on your your cannoness or your the your miraculous power. stuff. Yeah, no. that's the right. Yeah, yeah. And then you get one turn where you go uber potency, and um, yeah. They're very, very good as well. The 20-man 20, 20 sister units. I've got a lot of people talking about them for a variety of different ordered as well. A lot of people coming around to Valorous Heart all of a sudden, um, just for the sheer durability increases and the, the ignoring rend. And then a lot of other people are talking about um, Bloody Rose still, of course. Can't go wrong with Bloody Rose. Just like with Necrons, can't go wrong with Novox. Just a great color um, scheme as well. It's, it's really good. Isn't it? Yeah. So there's, there's a lot going on at the moment. And a lot going on talking about hordes and i think it's a really exciting uh place to be for a lot of players and it, so i saw this i don't want to i don't want to draw too long a, a bow here but um do you guys played through i don't know if you guys were fantasy players but the transition from seventh edition fantasy to eighth edition fantasy saw us going from what sixth and seventh edition were as well, well at least from my recollection as being kind of medium-sized units with a bunch of characters to being horde sized units as in 30 30 or more models mm-hmm. in a brick and we I, we saw that transition from eighth seventh to eighth edition and now we're kind of seeing an eighth edition to ninth edition but not quite forced that way as as it was in in um in fantasy in fantasy you got to attack in an extra rank you got which was ex- i don't need to tell you guys that was phenomenally like that increased the output of your art units ridiculously. Hey, when some you folks three might not know what rank and file is right now. Mm. Yeah, do, do you want to break it down? Uh, no, I don't think it's relevant. To, to the, but I'm saying <laughs> that's uh, that's that's still that's like a that's a bygone era thing. It really is. But uh, yeah, we saw that transition. I'm wondering if that's how we're going with this. So we don't have the. I mean, I don't think G Dub's pushing it as hard as they pushed. Um, as they as how do they push the hordes in in fantasy? But uh, well, okay. yeah, I mean, let's undeniable. be clear though. I mean, or at least let me state it. I don't think it's quote unquote pushed at all because you can still yeah. take five uh you, you know man units if you want you just now have the option of expanding and i think it uh, creates a nice an interesting dilemma of you know do you like, especially when you have such quality transports as an option mm. do you hide these things and and then spring them out in later turns and so maybe you just have a volume of units that your your opponent just simply cannot deal with when they're trying to pick off a unit dedicate enough firepower to take out the unit and the transport and the units that's still inside the transport so on and so forth does that does it actually create a list making dilemma or should we just all be taking the 20 man squads and getting on with our lives i feel like in general units that can take out 20 
or units that can take out 10 infantry can also probably just as easily take out 20. So because, and it also in general, you're not going to be putting too much into buffing your infantry squads. Um, I think that infantry squads would have more value at 30 man than 20 man. But yeah, I, I play it multiple small units, but I play them like one big unit. So, I mean, this is just because of how my list is built, but um, I basically take a like four 10 man infantry squads and I blob them up all around a Vexilla Defensor um, so that they all have the five up invulnerable save. And then to me, this is valuable because now they have an invulnerable save, but also I keep a company commander with them. So um, as they're moving up the unit uh, up the board as a unit, I can throw out one small unit from the blob to go contest an objective or hold an objective if for some reason that they they might survive no i think that's awesome i don't have i don't have any real like experience playing i i I mean i am playing orcs uh i've i've played a handful of games with them but they are new force for me so i haven't really gotten to play around too much with having like a flexible amount of troops in a unit um, I do hope that guard get that in a new codex. That would be really exciting for me to play around with. But as it stands, I kind of get the benefits of both a large unit and several small units, just the way that I play. Imagine if you could like buy a platoon and just keep adding squads into it. Ooh. <sighs> Yeah. Wouldn't that it be would cool? Be, it would just be really nice to have some flexibility. That's that's actually what we used to have mm-hmm. um, as far as 5th edition guard codex was. Oh that, was that was good. That was Amazing. Good it was cool because it, you could do infantry squads or you could add in like a heavy weapon squad or you could add in, uh, I think you could add in veterans as well. And so you could build out this. And then I think the next edition, it was just infantry squads, which wasn't a bad deal because you could still like, you know, plus them up. And then I'm pretty sure as we moved into eighth edition, that went away. And that, that was an interesting transition because I'm, I'm with you, you know, my guard models, my, my Tanith models that I'm, I'm you know, still unpacking right now are, I have a hundred of them. Uh, I have more than a hundred of them, but my list is 10 squads of 10 man, you know, 10 model Tanith units. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, to do very much like what you're talking about, just blob it on the field and then throw them out as I need them to. And there's just such a weight of, of, and this kind of plays into what we're talking about between the MSUs and the hordes and whatnot. There is a horde on the table, but you have to diffuse your own fire in order to get rid of all of that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's a good, that's I, a good perspective. On it. I, I do find that with a lot of the the ninth edition codexes, I I am. Like I'm just getting back into playing now as as my area is starting to open up. But with a lot of the new codexes, when I go in and play against those, the just the weight of fire is so incredible that I just feel for guard that it is more advantageous to play in MSU. I, losing a 10 man squad, that that's fine. But like I you could easily just lose a 30 man squad just the same. But yeah, I, I, I'm excited. I hope that it is a trend. I would love to have some flexibility in my troops. Well, when you think about, and this, this is this is like I said, I don't want to string too many long. We have bows, an embarrassment but, of riches talking about. Oh yeah, these codexes get this, <laughs> and the other ones don't right now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, so you look at what what G Dub's done a lot with all the codexes so far, and they're actually bringing like that thematic element back. We we got Trueborn back. We got Blood Brides back. We got all these things, and um, I would not be surprised if we see some element of that come back into it for guard. And maybe it's not that. Maybe it's more, you know, regimental advisors stuff. Maybe it's more company commanders getting upgraded to give more orders, or you know, orders at a, at a wider range without a vox, things like that, which are all super exciting. But the fact is that th- those are the things that are making me so excited about new codexes, just to see the little intriguing, characteristic, spicy bits that G Dub is injecting into them. Trueborn and Blood Brides and whatever the racks are called, and Menk. And make it whatever it is, um, have been amazing. That, that's also yeah. kind of what you encounter is because you're encountering yeah. the optimized, the tournament, the the most direct thing. And I, I thought we we're going to make a better case for some of the MSU stuff or the small, I shouldn't say smaller units because, but uh, that's what they are. Yes, you know, s- smaller units. And it just seems like if you can get a lot of units 
in a squad and then buff them up, that's probably the best way to go. I like to do both, and it might be frustrating to hear, but I think there are some armies that can do both, some armies that, that can't do both just yet. I mean, well, you know, like I said, Harlequins was my example for a very strong MSU scoot army. They can't do Horde very well. I've seen some people who run 50, 60 troop, but that's not quite the same thing as, you know, the same amount of Poxwalkers or the same amount of Sisters or Rangers or what, simply because they just twice as many points it's just that it is what it is i do love seeing a horde element in a lot of lists i'm a huge advocate for one unit of 20 sisters in almost every sisters list i'm seeing at the moment um, i'm a big advocate for if you can't make you know 40 or 60 rangers or vanguard one unit one block of 40 so one block of 20 vanguard or, or rangers pick your poison is i think is a great addition to every army and i suppose that's that leads to what you were saying, Paul. We're not being pushed into this. This is just a whole new element being added to armies that didn't have it before. And if we look at it like that, we can see it as something exciting rather than you know something punitive or anything like that, which it, it absolutely is not. Um, I just think that it's cool to have these things in your list because they bring something to the table that you couldn't, you just didn't have before. Yeah, like, and it has that benefit, the extra benefit of of looking like the core of the force that you would might expect to see on Mars or in a Ministorum Sanctum or what have you. Yeah, spot on. You're saying like we're not making the case for smaller units. I mean, maybe the case is that in a lot of lists there is room for both. I give it to you. So another another reason to take a bunch of units in the past was to have a proliferation of the special weapons, the melty gun, the plasma gun, mm-hmm. and, and so on mm-hmm. and so forth. You're, you're talking min-maxing or what we would generally call min-maxing, yeah? Yeah, the, like the old last plas days takes back mm. beyond oh, the file. You know, that, that's what, but with, um, with, I guess with the ability to add them in, like, you know, if you get larger, it's every, every 10 or their basic weapons are actually pretty good now. Yeah, we're starting to find that, isn't it? Like the G Dub is just making regular profile weapons really strong. Uh, I, I, I hate to come back to the ones I've already said, but those Gorse Reapers, those um, Galvanic rifles, man, do you actually need special weapons? I mean, yeah, the answer is no, not all the time. It used to be <laughs> you only took tactical Marines for the special weapons, you know? No lie, I'm thinking like, I could just kind of mix it up with an arc rifle every now and then if I wanted to, because I feel like the 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 um the actual work is going to get done off of their basic weapons, and so if I wanted to kind of sprinkle in a random, not always appropriate special weapon, then I had the flexibility to do so, and that's that's kind of a good thing, right? Well, this has kind of been empowered by the fact that in Age is Gone, literally with the exception of Eighth and Ninth Edition, a bolt gun couldn't hurt a runner. Like no matter what facing it was on, a bolt gun could not hurt a rhino chassis, you know? A- AV, AV10, strength four, couldn't happen. Oh, wait, was it? Wait, 10, 10 plus, I'm pretty sure four plus six. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, see, I see, I six good. <laughs> Jeez. Are you sure? Wow. I mean, look, wah, we got to... Adam. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that, 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 that was a thing. That was a thing. You had so many weapons that could not hurt X, Y, Z in your opponent's army. I remember playing in fourth edition and just scratching my head trying to figure out how to kill a, a dreadnought, a basic boxy dreadnought, just being like... I've only got like three chances to kill this thing before I run out of options. That was the and, worst uh, now, when you're locked in hand-to-hand combat with the Dreadnought and you're just hoping w- the one person you bought a crack grenade for would get the job. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Come on, little fella. This is it. Chance. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, um, but th- that's a thing, and that's really what's empowered some of these, uh, allowed some of these um, really standard uh, weapons platforms to to pop off and become really potent. Yeah, I mean, yes, I, I that was actually a point I think for both sides, the MSU and and the the Horde, is that your special your your basic weapons are are pretty strong in everything we've talked about so far. So you could do either and be just fine. Man, what yeah. does that feel like? Because <laughs> <laughs> my flashlights do nothing. Hey, you got first rank, second rank. <laughs> uh, yeah. I might well, be able to take a wound off a Marine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should go and play some guard. I've been really interested to see what can be done with mechanized guard and even mechanized scions to an extent. Because I've said it before on podcast, that's my favorite way to, to play any game. To Any game I've ever played, for playing, you know, 7th edition mechanized guard was the most fun I've ever had. And I want to recapture that because I feel like the rule set empowers that to a degree. But yeah, one of the things that, that puts me back is just that like in a lot of other armies, the 10-man units you have inside those transports actually do something when the transport dies. In guard armies, not so much. <laughs> you know? That's, no. that's why you got to play Katachin because they get to play in every phase. Psychic, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> the psychic Katachin is born. 
<laughs> I didn't say they played that, great in every phase. I said they get to play in every. But you're right. There is that to it as well. When you've got MSU armies and you've got a lot of a different value things on different value chassis, you do get to play more of the game. You just have more doors open to you. I think you mentioned that with mechanized and transports. I feel like the transports have a have a place in the game. I mean, even I know we talked about that you get tons of volume of shots and and their quality, they're incredible quality strength four shots. And you know that's not going to get it done against armor transports all the time. Mm. And especially if someone's making the same value decision that 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 I was just considering, it's like the special weapons. Granted, they're only like ten points, and they're not. I mean, I think I think the 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 sniper rifles a little a slightly more expensive, but you know, may, maybe you don't need them against most of the field right now. And so people may have a harder time popping those transports. And that's actually why I'm thinking about including more transports. And one of the reasons I was even going on this path of considering the efficiency of what to cram inside of them. Yeah, fair. I think there's, I, I think at the start of ninth edition, MSU was the obvious best way to play most armies. I don't want to say every army because that just wasn't, that's just not true, but it was the obvious best way to play the missions. You know, um, you only need one dude to control an objective and you only need one guy in a table quarter to get engaged. You know, one, you only need two dudes from two different squads to get a line breaker, etc. One guy to do a scrambler for as long as it's an infantry. Um, you know, you don't need to have big, big meaty squads. In fact, big squads was a hindrance. You needed to have all your squad. Every member of a 20 man unit had to be over the center line um, to get engaged in that quarter made it harder. Um, but now we're starting to see a kind of a redistribution of efficiencies that I think is making having a horde element in your list um, pretty exciting. I like that, but I, I still want to do both. Like I'd love to be able to have a core of say somewhere between forty and eighty guard infantry, a couple of mechanized veteran units, maybe a couple of special weapons teams in reserve, and then you know a couple of battle tanks and that that and maybe an artillery piece. And then I'm just like, ah, oh, every part of me is activated. I love this game. <laughs> Uh, I, I love it. that. I love that you're like, yeah, maybe I should play guard, and I'm like, well, I'm gonna play Dark Angels for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, roll reversal, love it. That's hilarious. With this, trying to cram in more units, if you go that route, uh, I th- is is it a trap to like overload them with war gear? Like, do you put the the Omni specs? on them like do you do you turn a 50 a 50 point unit into a 60 point unit or 55 point unit or then or then you're just getting too distracted by the the bells and whistles and so you might as well be protecting your eggs in your basket a little bit more by skewing towards the larger unit i don't think i'm helping (laughs) (laughs) i mean i feel like we we really just emphasized and re-emphasized what we were talking about with guard like have the blob make the blob go do more things guard get by with the orders because you know some people the fearless blobs of cultists was a thing right and i know orcs kind of get it here's something to also consider is i I think that orcs really went out uh especially against custodes right now because custodes can be the msu deal and Mm -hmm. spread out and they're they're very durable um, but somehow now orcs are about to come out and they're as tough as custodes. Ooh, um, that's a good point. They might not be one wound, but okay. So three custodes is they're three wounds a piece, right? If I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. So that's nine wounds versus 30, 30 boys. Uh, I, I don't know if all the boys got a T5 boost, but that's a big deal in the amount of wounds that you can put out. And I know they're not as tough. They don't have the same armor or invuln or what have you, but there's ways to make it count and make them stick in there. And um, I, I think that as we've seen with ninth edition, I think that the orcs are definitely going to be able to take advantage of that. Um, but that, that all goes to say, you know, that's a strength that's maybe more viable in the orc army. I don't think that guard, for example, have that real strength with a massive horde, you know, bringing the, what are they? Conscripts. I, I just don't think that that's as viable in comparison to bringing a bunch of infantry squads or, uh, you know, the scions, the, mil- the militarum, uh, tempestus. I think that you can really take advantage of MSU with guard in comparison. And so it's, I don't know if it's really one way or the other, Paul. I, I, I think it's, I don't think that we've really sold one side more so than the other. It really just comes into how you want to play it, which I think is a wonderful and awesome thing about ninth edition, because we've kind of, uh, in the competitive and in narrative and across the board, just a, a ton of flexibility in approaching it and not just a, a cookie cutter, you know, one size fits all approach. 
Yeah, well said. Well said. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think we're solving this issue. It's going to come down to what you what you're trying to accomplish. What you what secondaries are you comfortable uh, thinking or trying to attain or work towards? And that's one of the things in, in your mind too. What kind of what kind of play style you want to you want to try to achieve? What do you normally play against? I think that's right. it. What kind of training are you plan on or trying to maneuver a bunch of f- large units around a hindrance? You know, I, does someone just pick up your small units as soon as you put them on the table because they're, you know, they're, they're playing with something that has their rate of fire to do so. And you know, that's uh, all, all things, I think all things to consider. It must have been a fun topic, I think, to kind of roam around a bit. So thank you all for indul- indulging me. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, let's take a break. Then we'll come back. Maybe talk about some team building. Uh, maybe talk yeah. about, yeah, some, uh, some all kind of stuff. Hang in after the break. FTN is brought to you by Discount Games, Inc. Please visit them at www.discountgamesinc.com. And don't forget to ask Jay about ways to save even more on your hobby projects. Hey everybody, we are back. Still got everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for hanging in in the break. Thanks for supporting our sponsors. It means a lot. And then clicking all the buttons and stuff for us. Leaving five-star reviews. I'm gonna. I'm trying to make a habit of asking for that more. <laughs> of all the stuff. But it truly means a lot. So thanks everybody who has done it and continues to do it. The comments, you know, and everything really helped the the algos and stuff. And while I've got you, want to talk about team building and team events. I'm actually pretty jazzed. A good portion of my gaming club, my gaming team, is coming in this weekend. We're going to basically have a gaming extravaganza. I'm so jealous. <laughs> it's going to be cool. It's, it's going to be cool. Uh, yeah, but uh, that uh, it led to our had us talking about something interesting in the pre-show and in, in the break about uh, coming together for War, Warhammer team events. And then, you know, maybe how that relates to also competing as a team in things like the ITC and, and that kind of stuff. And those are those are two different lines of discussion. One of the things I wanted to, to talk about is getting to round one with your entire team is sometimes the biggest hurdle. And, and how does one even do that? And like the whole team dynamic to this this thing that we traditionally think as a as a one we one v one type game. So there's a, a few different levels of this. Of course, we have um we have club play, and uh, I suppose we're, we're, when we talk about clubs, I think is I, the ITC is the the major proponent of of clubs and supporting um club you know putting putting a club down when you play a play an event or play in a league so that you get an accumulation of points to show how well your club is doing and your club can you can compete together with your friends as a single entity and then we got um i suppose what we traditionally call as like team tournaments or team events and that's usually when you've got a, a conglomeration of you and your mates in in paul's case you got uh was what four four your mates three or four your mates coming together that's it and uh, yeah you'll you'll play in events together you'll almost play as, uh, one atc worth of <laughs> Of gamers, yeah. I was going to say, was that a gaggle? So <laughs> yeah, a gaggle of gamers. In ATC, and, uh, of, yeah. of gamers, you'll play as a you, as a single entity um, and pair yourselves into other teams and play a you know one game of of Warhammer each, and then you'll decide based on the results of each pairing of which team has won that round. And uh, there are so many more teams events on the horizon springing out of the woodwork. I feel like, and this is just speculation, but this is my soul says when we were denied the ability to have the camaraderie and the connections of this community due to COVID. The best way of us to get back to that and the best way that people have found or people are leaning towards is team play. It brings so many more people together, gets people stuck together, sticking together and making friendships and connections really quickly in a, a, such a positive and awesome way. Uh, it's just awesome to see us lean into it after such a kind of crappy 2020 and what that ended up being. I do love team events. It's actually w- become one of my most favorite ways to experience even competition 40k because of like even some of the things the trials that we're going to talk about it it's all it's all fun it's all to the experience and if you learn how to navigate it it's it's truly rewarding i think yeah i agree with that nothing has been as rewarding for me as winning team events um nothing has even come close even the team events that i haven't won um those you'll know i've played in a couple of wtcs for for australia played you know international 40k and uh those have been some of the best experiences of my my life to be honest i can't really speak to playing warhammer 
um, on a team. I, all of my friends who've done it before say it's like the best way to play Warhammer. So <laughs> I do, I do one day want to experience that. I just not had the opportunity to yet. I will say because I used to play roller derby, which is a team sport, and um, there's just something so special about like traveling with a group of like-minded individuals, knowing that you have each other's back, and like you're going into something for a common goal. There's just really nothing quite like it. And I mean, yeah, of course you want to win, but like, even if you lose, it's still like a fulfilling and worthwhile experience because you came together even and you, the, and you the tried. training leading up to it, like the communication, yeah. the, the stuff, the, the, the back and forth, the cooperation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do have friends that are on like team Canada for the WTC and um, just seeing the amount of work while well, not seeing it, but hearing secondhand, um, the amount of work that they put into it, it it really does remind me of of playing a sport. It's it's pretty amazing. The army is a a team sport in a lot of ways. I mean, there's there's very few things I can think of at any part in the the 16 years I've been doing this that I can say that's something I'm gonna do by myself. Um, in fact, uh, there's it's incredibly few things I can think that it's something that I would do by myself. And so when it comes to, to team aspects, it's so important going into something like, you know, we're talking about these, these Warhammer events that you really do pay attention to how you go about your team. And, and that's not just, you know, how you, I mean, there's a logistical aspect like Paul, I mean, your friends are coming from all over, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and there's something to that. And when you're trying to get to an event and you're trying to make something happen, um, you have a, a common goal or, or you should to a certain extent. And, and it's OK for different members of the team to have uh, their own motivations and, and maybe their own sub goals within that. But as a team, you, you know, if you're trying to accomplish something, that's that's the whole purpose to it. And and trying to recognize that and figure that out, because. There have been times where, where I'm sure we can think in one aspect or another where our goals in different teams that we've been in have been desynchronized, right? right? And that causes degrees of friction that can ultimately mean that maybe, you know, the team doesn't jive as well and doesn't get along as well or, or doesn't accomplish yeah, you as, don't much have as much as fun. Might hope. Right. right. Yeah, exactly. And and that's, you know, that there there are plenty of fish in the sea when it comes down to it. And there are plenty of folks that that might share your your objectives and then sometimes it, it does you know going into a team aspect in order to achieve the level of fun for everybody there are aspects that you have to understand that you know maybe you aren't going to be the most competitive team out there but as long as you're having fun together there's a lot more to to take advantage of there as a as a group and and things to make it more memorable and whatnot because i, I mean it's almost something psychologically proven that when we collaborate um we we just tend to do that much more and that much better and so going into this like i said you know my job there, there's a ton of team building aspects to it and uh my my profession of what i do is is about team building and there, there's some aspects to that in demonstrating how you care right like i mean there, there's times i can think of going to team events and, and Sometimes people don't have, you know, you think about some ATCs, sometimes people don't have as much fun as you might hope. And and that can be, it's not bringing necessarily you down, but you do want, you know, to, you want it to be better. You want to be able to improve and help. And there's things that you can do as far as how you go about your team and things like that, that you can help try and prevent things like that, as well as develop and support and build things up. And so, you know, it, it there's so much, just like you said, Paul, and going to getting to the event, just getting there, you know, having a plan, uh, uh, think of everything that one person that, that you out there listening does in regards of just getting yourself to an event and all that, you know, Paul, I, I can think of you guys were, you and your team were getting ready to go to Adepticon and you were working on one of your projects, which was, you know, going to uh, Adepticon. There's, there's these massive project teams, right? And and you guys were, were in crunch time for Admech, I think. Um, it was just a big project that you had going on. Uh, 2,000 and, points and, in two weeks. That's right. Oh. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, that's, but that's the needs of the team, right? Like yeah. that's what you guys wanted to get in there. And so to have that, think of that kind of collaborative drive that it's not just for yourself, but for your whole team. 
and there, there's a lot more onus in regards of, of how you go about it. And it's amazing what that kind of motivation can do for individuals when they come together. And then, of course, getting there, right? I mean, we've got, there's the uh, the triple threat coming up in the Southeast in the U.S. Uh, I think it's just this coming up weekend. I mean, I've got two, I've got two Army teams, uh, Army esports teams that are attending that event. And to coordinate everything, make sure we have the right kind of team and the right makeup and that everybody's on the same page and and you do, you know, we're, we're all peers, but there is a, a team captain to one extent or another. And it helps when you've got someone to be able to make the decision. Well, I, I was going to mention that is that you're not necessarily talking about or we're not necessarily talking about being the leader. It's about or we what we're, I think, going to talk about is just being what it takes to be on a team and how to cooperate, how to communicate, and how to, to get the objective. But, yeah, you definitely That's need right. somebody's checking off the boxes being the <laughs> Making sure the well, logistics I mean, or whatever. Yeah, there are. There's logistics, getting the team there, doing you know team captain duties. And there's, there is something to that matching and whatnot, especially if you consider ATC. This The Las Vegas team tournament's coming up later this year and, and how you go about that and whatnot. There's just so much to the logistics and, and making the team event happen because for the number of people that show up, that's just that many armies that have to be coordinated to do that. Mm. It's almost like you don't want an emperor. You want Horace. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> How long will you wait but, to say that? Uh, literally ages, like so <laughs> long. Ever si- yeah, yeah, ages. I've just been sitting here on my hands, being like, "Yep, yeah, great line coming up. Great line, everybody." <laughs> hold on. Uh, but no, but uh, breaking that down, when you talk about leadership, it, you want a first among equals. You don't want an authoritative person. I don't think, especially people in our community, from my experience, don't respond that well to that. Um, but at the same time, I need a clip around the years every now and then. Sometimes I get caught up in my own little world of what I think is good and what I think my best thing is for a team. And sometimes I genuinely need teammates to just be like, Adam, like this, you know, we don't need you to do this. You don't need to be everything all the time. And uh, here's the role we want you to fulfill. And we want to help you do that to the best of your ability. I could see that being a real life issue for somebody in the army. Is that a thing? I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Uh, well, and, and there is something to it that there's a hierarchy and structure and, and in our hierarchy of ranks, the military specifically comes various authorities. And that's a very important aspect of mm. what comes with leadership positions is what authorities are attached to what and what decisions can be made. But um, to go into that, though, there's so much more than just that one, you know, facet of it. And and so a lot of my business now is not and, it, and it, it's not just about the authority that's associated and the responsibilities, but the ability to to inspire, motivate and and lead. And you can lead by being a follower just as much as you can as actually being the designated leader. Right. Uh, you can as a, a team member and you see there, there's different roles that can go into teams. You can be, it's it, even the person who is the devil's advocate is a contributing member of the team, right? When you sit there and you've got everybody agreeing to something, but the 10th man is saying, well, what about this? And while that might be sometimes the most aggravating thing <laughs> that you have to deal with, it still is a contributing factor in considering that, hey, maybe the other nine of us out of these, this team or, you know, take the, the, the triple threats, a three, you know, three V three kind of deal. You know, you've got two people that think, well, we can just slant the team in this way to make it that much more effective. But the other person says, well, have you considered these things that might be mm-hmm. different from what, what we have might have fallen into a group think or a, a heavier bias on? And so oh, and you're like, oh, just build the fire wars and stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so, I, mean, I mean, the end result of that is you get an echo chamber where really nothing productive happens. Um, so you're absolutely right. Everyone, as, I don't want to call people of people this ilk naysayers, but you do need to have genuine, honest and open conversations inside a team, especially Especially in one as complex as as Warhammer, like it, it's very hard. It's very unlikely you'll get a team of four individuals, and all four people are on a specialist in f- and dedicated to four separate factions. Because that's another consideration. A lot of the 40k teams, you can only take one faction per team. Can't have four Space Marine players. You might have four people who play Space Marines and have Space Marine armies, but only one of them gets to play that army in that team. That's right. And yeah. due to things like that, there's always be a little bit of maneuvering. I don't want to say I don't want to call it maneuvering, but there's always some to some extent you do 
have to consider people's feelings. And, and unlike other sports, you can't really get somebody who's proficient at playing tennis, put them on and, and make them play football. You know, <laughs> you know, it doesn't really translate like that. There's not many other comparisons we can make to what 40K is like in that extent. But you have to actually take people's considerations into account when you're building a team. Maybe, you, maybe if you've got three guys out of your four best mates that all play the same army, you have to say to them, like, honestly, sorry, man, like this one, we need to get somebody who's going to play something different because we actually just can't can't take you you know we've got two power armor guys already one was playing grain eyes one was playing space rings because we have to split them up and you can only play you, you you only have a space wolves army um do you want if you don't want to borrow one of mine i'm sorry man like well, I'm not sure let me to... let me take a step back that's just a, for a hard conversation to have but yeah, yeah. sorry no no so, so one step back here is that these team events uh, you know yeah you can go into it and want to win and then you have to decide what you're willing to do to achieve that victory, what you think you need. And trust me, sometimes you don't even have to do some of this stuff. Uh, we're talking about how to, you know, I think you were talking about there, how to bring out the most efficiency and maybe the stakes may be higher or whatever. Uh, you can oh. win. The, every one of these events has their own kind of criteria for, for victory, such as Adepticon. It's, there's there's a huge amount of display and theme that, that factor into the overall victory and then play style. Uh, in the in the ATC, you're right, you're, you're talking about every, no, no codex, no faction can be repeated and you're playing individual games, but contributing to an overall team score. Some, you know, each of them are going to have their different paths to victory. Yeah, you're spot on. Sorry. So maybe maybe just to like take it in a little bit of a different direction here. So I am on an ITC team, right? So you know, um, we get we get together. We like carpool to events and stuff, but we've never taken part in like a team tournament. So we've got our core group, and say we decide now we want to go to a to a team tournament. What would be like the first thing that we should do as a team if, look at, if that's something that we want to do yeah absolutely look at the format mm -hmm. the, the format's going to guide so much of how you go into it understanding like okay how many people are playing what's the setup you know what are the list restrictions by player and when i talk about format you know is there different setups like how are, how is the matching being done how do you match team members are you just randomly assigned or do team captains have the ability you know is there some kind of back and forth like atc for example there's something to the construction of the team and having a defender, having a very difficult list that may not always win, but definitely won't lose easily. And so it creates a, a margin of points because in the format of points for ATC, for example, a lot of it's built off of how many points are removed from the winners and the losers and mm -hmm. what's given there. And so, you know, do you want to put a blocker kind of list into your team? And that's things that you just have to consider as you go into it. So the format, I think, becomes really, okay, this is the event we're going to go to. It's a uh, a 2v2, a 3v2, 3, you know, whatever. It's a, a five-man team, something like that. Why or, or how are we going into this? Because that's going to change, you know, like Paul was saying, the Adepticon and everything that goes into the the aesthetics of your army and the overall team theme and the message behind it. You know, is that something you want to do? Is that the kind of team event you want to go to? And then how do you play it and how does it match up? Because so, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, isn't Adepticon only so many points and then you, it, it, doesn't each person have a thousand points? Is that correct? And yeah, then, you're playing every, every, but you're playing on two people on each table. So you're collectively make up 2000 point, a 2000 point army. Right. Yeah. On each table. So, right. So that's, that's just that different. But right. that, that's a that's a, the culture of that tournament is you're playing you not only are you you playing contributing to the the overall team score but you're playing cooperatively when with another human being there at the table with you right uh, which is different than like the WTC or the ATC where you're you're playing a one v one game you're playing five to eight one v one games that are contributing to the, to the overall yeah. which is a different dynamic so did that that help kind of answer your question Tanya in regards of if you guys were going to consider that yeah for sure and I mean. <sighs> It, when I played a sport, we as a team would sit down at the beginning of the season and be like, how do we want to do this? Like, are we going to, is this a development year for us? Are we going to just go play as many games as possible and sort of rotate the bench to make sure everybody's getting their games in? Or is this the year that we want to make a run for it? That we want to like win a lot of games? Like, like I think that sitting down and having like, a pretty well laid out plan or or goal 
for what you want to achieve. Uh, for me, it was always like the first step. So mm. it, evaluating the format really allows you to like go back and like hammer out what your goal is going to be. I think that's great. Sometimes you decide in round three that it's development year for you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, sometimes at halftime in the locker room, you'd be like, well, that didn't go to plan. We're just going to have fun then. Yeah. Everybody's going to get a chance to play. All right. <laughs> uh, but we're talking about making, you know, the, the hard decisions if you are trying to win out a tournament, but that's actually no different than, how you attack a format but yeah i think i think red hit it right on the head is some of these are a little bit more conducive to the the actual camaraderie again i mentioned you're playing on the same table or whatever but they have they've all got that connective tissue i think of of being where you feel like you're you're greater than the than just the one game that you're playing there's more on, there's more intensity, if you ask me, on the result of your individual game than it would be if you were just playing for yourself. And I think that's exciting. Mm, okay. Okay. The next thing you got to do is get a sweet team name. Like, I'm talking a sweet team name. Every team, sweet team name. No one wants to play against the boring guys. Everyone wants to play against the sweet team name funny dudes. Everybody wants to play against team participant. Shout out to my ITC team, team <laughs> participants. <laughs> We're just happy so, to be there, y'all. <laughs> just, to, just to take a quick segue story. Um, I, I'm, a team, I'm a, a member of Art of War. That's my club. That's who I play for. And all as soon as as soon as we kind of emerged and started playing as Art of War as a club, everyone started parroting us. Like we had guys. <laughs> the, this probably the the most other competitive team started calling themselves Sun Tzu, <laughs> as in um, after. <laughs> the art of war novel from you know by yeah and uh, another team called himself art of milk because the guy's the captain is obsessed with milk let's not go into that but uh <laughs> It, we all lost our minds with how hilarious the intrigue of the names got that we it was the best thing ever. And even like that, you can just squeeze so much enjoyment out of stuff like that. Uh, I like okay. c coming up with a list, you know, that, and this is another where it's a point of friction to kind of get us slightly on topic is that there are, there are obstacles that come up along the way. Sometimes it's coming down to the list. It's like, in like you kind of add on what you're talking about before is, does someone have to play what they want to play or do they have to play what they have to play? You know, wh what do you, how do you reconcile that? How do you uh, bridge that obstacle? And, and that's why I think it's really important. And I think this is the reason I like team events because it really promotes having open discourse, having respectful relations with each other and being mindful of other people's feelings because it comes with some hard conversations. I've had to talk to people at several different levels of the game being like, sorry, dude, uh, we need to give that faction to this guy um, can you play this, 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 this is why. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes the guy's like, oh yeah, that makes, that makes all the sense in the world. Other people are like, oh man, I don't know if I can play that faction the way you want me to. Maybe I'll sit out this one. But I'll tell you right now, I've never lost a friendship because of any of that stuff. I've never had any one of those conversations go in such a way that I feel like I've damaged a relationship or a connection. It's in fact, I think those things only make things stronger, having those open and honest discourses. And of course you go out of your later, you know, I go out, you go out of your way and make sure that guy has a good time or, um, or especially if you're a TO, you let the TO know that, you know, you've got a player on X faction and a lot of the time a TO will find a team for that, that player or whatnot. And it's never like, oh, you're, it's never a conversation of, oh, you're not good enough, blah, 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 blah. It's, it's usually, usually comes down to logistics of, of team play, like, you know, X, Y, Z. Results may vary here, by the way. So take, yeah, yeah. take everything we're saying with it. <laughs> of course. Every, yeah, of course. Um, but most of the time, it, yeah, it comes down to logistics. People can't attend. People, you know, people have marriages, children and complications and stuff like that. And. I'll tell you what, team play has made me more friends than singles ever did. Yeah, I, I love it. Again, again, going there and and you know, like living and dying together on yeah, you know, on the on the field, whatever that is, the the landscape. It's 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 really fun. And then coming together, and, like, and this is when it's also a travel experience. Like there's, you know, there's a lot to do to get you to that point of actually rolling dice in turn one of the tournament. Yeah. And I think it's easy to underestimate what it takes to get there. What are, what are some legitimate, tangible things people can do to build cohesive um, in, environments for teams? Uh, I think that in regards of team building and some tangible things, Tanya, you hit it right on the head in regards of goals. Having understanding where everybody's coming from and what goals that they're trying to get out of it, because some people personally might be on their own kind of developmental plan, right? And, and then understanding that you might have a more competitive player amongst your your team than maybe some others, 
And especially the way that some of the personality aspects can go with games, you know, someone might not be able to uh, appreciate the learning experiences they might have from losing. Um, you know, they might take that a little differently. And, and so that might set them off where they don't enjoy themselves and don't have as good of a time. And so there's a couple things you can go into. And the, the goal setting is one thing, because if you understand where everybody's going with that, you can kind of help coach each other along the way to get there. Because some of that preparation might not just be logistics and painting an army. Some of it might be practice. Some of it might be list building, understanding the meta you're going into and the format and doing that together and not just leaving someone out on their own. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so uh, there, there's a lot to that aspect and being able to realistically set that because, you know, having a team that's together and, and can appreciate that enough where, OK, maybe this isn't the time that we're going to go hard in the paint and make it to the, the top tables, but we're going to go enjoy ourselves, get used to the format, get get a feel for what's happening, understand where we're at by playing, right? Because I think in a lot of cases, especially, you don't really determine where you're at as a team until you truly execute together. That's a little bit more difficult to some extent with, say, like my profession, because we don't necessarily go to war in that, you know, at at full pace and, and speed, but you do building exercises and you build in the tempo and the the rate at which you exercise and by doing those things together and increasingly, you know, turning up the heat, you know, in regards to the exercise and making it tougher on yourself as you go along, that stresses the team and the system. And you can see where some of your weaknesses are and you can truly start to build a greater degree of confidence in what you're able to accomplish. And so giving yourself the time to do that as a team is very important in my opinion and understanding where you're at realistically in regards to where you want to go so that you can afford yourself the time to do that, the experiences you want to get along the way and truly being able to also, there, there's something to being able to step back and reflect and think of all the things that you've done as a team and what you can can appreciate on what you've accomplished from where you were at and what you've done together. Like it, it's hard. I know that that sounds very uh, soft, maybe esoteric, but I, I really do think that being able to appreciate what you and your friends have done together and being able to appreciate that going forward and know that you can do more or you can in, continue to enjoy it really sinks in what you're doing, why you're doing it and, and what you're going for. And, um, and, and I, that, that's what I would recommend. I, I know that that sounded like a, a lot, but in the regards of the tangible and making things mean something to you, we all have invested so much in this hobby and there really is so much to the community. You know, you talk about the team events being some of the more memorable events for you and, and that you they're a great focus for this game. Why? Because it accentuates, it really takes the community and puts the community into the game uh, more so than even just the one-on-one kind of games. And and that's what I really appreciate about it too. Um, So I I hope that was helpful and answered your question, Adam. Um, There's so many different ways you can look at it too. So with there being as many moving parts, you can maybe compensate for something else in another way. Uh, As a, for instance, Consult the allies chart if you're playing, you know, in a uh, on a in a in a, an environment to where you're playing on the same table or two people are playing on the same table. If they butt heads a lot, but yet they're playing the list that are both com- best complement each other, you may switch one of those lists to somebody else. Right. You know, there's yeah, there's many important. things to consider of that. And I know it may that may seem like you're having to to manage things you didn't think you were going to manage going into a team environment, but that is actually the, that's the case. Yeah, for sure. Was there would there ever be an instance where maybe you would pick a less talented player to be part of your team? Like or like if you're going to win it, are you just always going to take like the best player, even if there's maybe like an attitude issue or anything like that. It depends on the format. Uh, yeah. And but in, in a in situation, even in a team event that it eventually breaks down into one one 
V1. I think that's less of a concern where you are forced into proximity and uh, have to co- cooperate with another team member. I, I mm-hmm. think it's absolutely a consideration that could be an obstacle to your overall fun or or winning. And in a, in an event to where even in in a in a well, ultimately boils down to one v one, you can have a weaker player on the team and still win. Like there's multiple ways to get to insulate yourself from those types of things. But uh, and, and I think I, I think that's a great point, Paul. And I think. Uh, Tanya, to your your question, I think also that there's going back to what I said as far as just recognizing where you're at realistically. If you have someone else on your team that is very competitively minded, uh, maybe more so than other members of the team, just understanding how you're going to balance that and uh, whether you're the team captain or not, you just need to be able to appreciate that that person's going to get frustrated over this or that. Um, and then maybe the the junior player or the, the less experienced player maybe could be overwhelmed by some of the things. And so how are you as a team going to lean forward and help that team member and being able to to understand what's going on or or not be overwhelmed and and those kinds of things and if you have enough time you know what can you do to maybe hopefully better prepare them and and things like that and so knowing the the strengths and weaknesses of your team members their motivations and and really you you have to care about each other in my opinion to really uh exponentially step up how you can do that as a team and, and build build up each other um I feel like my instinct in that particular instance where you have somebody who's more competitive and maybe you also have developing players on the same team, my initial instinct would be to give the competitive player a new challenge. Like maybe that's the player that you give a new faction to. Sure. Absolutely. Right. It it sort of like keeps their mind occupied on a task other than nitpicking what the other developing players are doing. Sure. If you were that in a situation be. to where the the format of the event demanded that not everyone play what they were most like, as if, for instance, if they were, everyone was a Marine player and you only could mm-hmm. use one Marine player, I think given the the new list, the cha- the the brand spanking new thing that no one had any experience with to the person that's going to attack that like it's their job is a good strategy mm-hmm. for sure. Interesting. It's just really interesting to see like how the sports team strategies might also fit into like a Warhammer team strategy. When you're when you're walking out to the mound to tell the pitcher he's done, for <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a difficult conversation sometimes. Um, but we've had very enthusiastic people and great exemplary team members that wanted to take their you know what they consider their favorite faction to the event. But when they're not the best at that faction, mm. that's a tough conversation. But you got to decide if that matters to you or not. Like, are you? Is it? Is it more? Is it more important to you that they get to play, get to have the most fun that weekend, playing whatever, come win or lose? Like, and are they in the mindset that they understand that they need to do something different for the better of the team? Those are those are things. Hopefully, that are all always in alignment, but you don't necessarily know if they are. But if you, that's a that's a. That's a different question, I think, than you asked of like, how do you jump into the team tournament scene if you have not done it already? I think just exploring the format and asking asking questions in groups, figuring out what the expectations are. Look at the scoring. What actually contributes to whatever finish is best sport? One of the top awards, kind of thing. Like, there's mm-hmm. f- figure out what your expectations of winning the same the same way you would for any tournament. It's just cooler because you got more people involved in the outcome. You know, with the team tournaments. Do you do you ever like consider having like a quote farm team for the actual team where you like take developing players under your wing and bring them into your training and uh, scout them out? Yeah, kind of so- like develop them as you're going out to events. Be like, hey, maybe one day you could be here, buddy. <laughs> No, absolutely. And so, so the, the U S army, uh, 40 K team, actually, we, we have three team categories, right? Um, so we have what's our, our main team, we have an academy team, and then we have a, a watch list team. Uh, the watch list team is a much broader list. Uh, I'm only allocated so many slots for the others so that you, you have some kind of, you know, competitive nature to this at, to the team as a whole. But the um, there absolutely is some aspects to that, and it, it's not it's not just one you know you're it's totally based on your performance, but it is also um, got a more comprehensive aspect of you know how you present yourself and and how you 
participate and your reputation and integrity and and all these things that are expected of, of good players and how that develops. And so there are people on the team, particularly like the academy and in the watch list, that are people that demonstrated interest in wargaming and playing 40K that are in the army. And so bringing them on the team so they can start building the team, getting used, you know, getting used to communicating and preparing for events and, and the, the people that are competitive in the academy and main team can help those other folks develop and bring them under their wing and, and kind of get into it. And and that's what you just suggested, Tanya, is exactly what we're trying to do in building this better wargaming culture amongst the team. Um, and, and I think that there's a lot of goodness to doing that approach. And I've, I've been really happy to see it grow and develop over these last couple of years too. Folks, we're out of time. Uh, I mean, that's, <laughs> Yeah, this has been a, a wonderful topic, uh, Adam. Thanks for suggesting the pre-show. Seriously, thanks for uh, the questions and all the comments and stuff. And uh, it's, it's, been, it's been a great topic. And, and Red, I'm glad we could benefit from your real-world experience in the conversation here. Well, I mean, it sounds like every you know all of you guys have just as much real-world experience as well. You just had it play out in other ways. Well, thanks all for joining us for the show this week. We'll be back next week. We'll see you all then. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. craft worlds are sentient beings. These hosts are not. Better luck next time, monkeys!